All right, folks. Hello, and welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Hammercast. I'm your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin, and I'm very excited today because joining me is one of the guys who has done probably more of my programs and challenges than many others. The guy who's profited and prospered from them greatly. His name is his his. We'll say his civilian name is Jim Bain, but his superhero name is the Scottish Mad Lad. And uh, as you will see, he has uh, a very cool Scottish accent. And I was telling him via email, Americans just love the Scottish accent. So um, he's uh, he's going to regale you with that, as well as some pretty awesome stories from some of the experiences that he has had on his journey through strength and fitness over the last couple of years, uh, particularly doing a number of my programs and challenges. So we're going to dive into that momentarily. But before we do, as I always tell people that if they have not already, I highly suggest you get my nine minute kettlebell and body weight challenge, which as the name implies is only nine minutes long and is designed to be done in conjunction with your regular training, not separate from it. So you don't have to put your regular workouts to the side. You just toss this in and it's like a, a turbo booster on your training. A lot of people have gone through it, told me that you know, their upper body strength, lower body strength has gone through the roof. You know, they're able to do more reps of their favorite exercises, the more resilient stuff like that. And uh, all the moves are very simple to learn because they're based off of your body's gait pattern or your walking pattern. So it's stuff like crawling, loaded carries, things like that. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it's free too. So go to nine minute challenge.com. Get your own free copy. Uh, that is the number nine minute challenge.com. I should mention somebody once told me they typed in like N I N E minute challenge. And it's like, no, you just made that way too hard on yourself. So at number nine minute challenge.com and it's all yours. So, uh, without further ado, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Now, um, I am especially curious first and foremost to hear about your origin story. I, you know, I think I, since I've given you a superhero nickname of the Scottish Mad Lad, no superhero, at least nowadays, is complete without having some sort of, you know, time spent around the origin story. So tell me a little bit about uh, what life was like growing up. Were, like, were you always very physically active? Did you get into training later in life or early on? Uh, give us the, uh, the, the full rundown. As a young kid, like everybody else, and football was a big thing. It was a big thing in Scotland, Britain in general. You have to play football, it's in the rules. Mm. So, well, yes, it is. Um, high school, that's when I started really. That was going to the gym, lifting weights. I was quite good at it, I was quite strong, but um, load on was the thing. We weight lifting, was like just doing endless repetitions, and I kept drifting in and out of the gym. You know, to do different things. Left that, done boxing, martial arts, all those kind of things as a teenager. Uh, the twenties I didn't quite do so much, but by then I was labouring and building sites and everything was a physical job. So mm -hmm. a lot of strength involved all the way through twenties, thirties. So your early days involved what sound like kind of like the classic early days where kids were put through a lot of different sports or a lot of different physical activities. And, uh, you know, in, we, in the U S we call it uh, football, but obviously yeah, everywhere else in the world, I'm sorry, we call it soccer, but everywhere else in the, in the world, it's called football. And, um, I can only imagine too, that in those early days, it was probably pretty rough. I think kids nowadays have a tendency to be less rough and tumble. What like, what was that like? I don't know, going up against your classmates trying to win a game of, of football or soccer. <laughs> like you're saying, things are completely different nowadays. But back then, we had training pitches that were, that were gravel. It was just little sharp stones, and that's what we played on. Cut your legs to bits. <laughs> You'd be in ribbons. You just couldn't get away with that nowadays. No, but yeah, not at all. I, like, I went to a Catholic school, so it was school against schools and areas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Me, I was always either in goals or in defence. I was always taller, bigger. So I was just kind of like a unit in the background there. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, you mentioned a Catholic school, so I'm curious because we, in the U.S., we have like the um, the stereotype of the old school Catholic school, like the nuns with the rulers and they'd like wrap you on the knuckles. Did you have to deal with that? Oh, we didn't. We did have a nun and there was a couple of priests and stuff like that, but it wasn't overly strict. So, yeah, I mean, oh, you did okay. go to 
and and things like that. Um, no, I'm not mad. No, I'm so pleased. I gotta tell <laughs> you, since you're mentioning the Catholic school, I think you'll find this funny. Now, my my uh, my coach and mentor Scott Stevens, he went to a Catholic school here in Omaha, Nebraska, which. I think, you know, because uh, Catholic schools in the U.S. just have the reputation of being like tough, you know, or meaning it's like very strict, very regimented, you know, like uh, what have you. Scott told me, I don't think he told me this on the podcast. He told me this separately, but he said that when he was <clears throat> when he was going to school and I, this would have been decades ago because he was I think he was talking about maybe sixth through ninth grades that he went or something like that. I don't remember if it was middle or high school, but um but he said that the priests would like get the some of the I think it was high school. They would get like some of the seniors in on this kind of prank. So they would be like what they would do is they would uh, like the first day of school that like uh -huh. one of the priests would pull one of the the um, the older kids, one of the big ones. So it's usually like a like an American football player type, you know, so like I think like rugby player type person, you know. Uh -huh into their office and then they would make all this commotion like people like they were getting thrown around the office you know and like whatever and then and of course everybody would look because everybody would hear it and then all of a sudden like you know the football player would like run out and they'd be like and don't make me pull you into my office again you know like as though they just completely roughed up the like this big kid so that so that the other kids would just stay yeah exactly and so of course you know the the bigger kids were in on it or whatever but it was for the freshmen and the sophomores to know you know, to mind your P's and Q's. And I guess probably by the time they got to their senior year or their, their, you know, their final year in high school, they were allowed to, they were allowed in on the secret, but, uh, but that, that always, it's always something I'm curious about whenever I hear somebody tell me they went to Catholic school. I'm like, what was it like? Because mm -hmm. we hear these stories and it seems like at least at, at Scott's school, they wanted to kind of perpetuate those things, but it sounds like they were pretty laid back for the most part. Well, yeah. And they, by the time I went to school, in the eighties, well, late seventies, eighties, corporal punishment—that was my thing. So, right, no big rough up or anything like that. Right, you had to use He's... mind games. Sorry, you had to use mind games instead, like they did at Scott School. Played mind games, yeah, yeah, that was very clever, very clever on their part. So, now we mentioned something about having like a very physically laborious job. Um, what are some of the jobs that you had, like in the early days, that uh, that you felt like you're, uh, you kind of transitioned from, you know, like being and a rough and tumble type of uh, you know sports and stuff like that as a kid, all the way into uh, into career. Has it always been the same thing? Have you have you kind of gone through like a variety of different jobs? Like what what's some of the the physical labor you've done? Yeah, there's loads of different jobs. Um, I've done a lot in building sites. I was doing labour and mm -hmm. um, that was quite a few years on and off. Still at the docks, working on um, pipe one on underwater pipes. Mm. Um, we cover them in cement so they can stay down on the seabed and uh, put big wire cages to strengthen them and all that kind of thing. Wow. So yeah. were you now for something like that, um, you mentioned being in the pipes. So you were in, were you like in scuba gear doing this or this was like they were, uh, how did that well, work? It came into a big plant. It was like a big crane would drop them down and it would go through. I mean, this plant was huge. It would yeah. go through and, and then you put the wire coat on, then you would start putting the cement on it, once it was all finished, it'd go into a big cargo ship and they would take it up to the North Sea somewhere and embed it down in the ocean. Wow. Then you get the underwater divers who would weld it and stuff like that. But, Gosh. Yeah, that does sound pretty intense. And uh, when was this? This was probably like, what, 20-some uh, years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, myself, I was probably, yeah, early 20s, mid-20s. Wow. That sounds like a like a rough gig. Now, did you did you enjoy it, or was it one of those things where you're like, ah, you know what, I just don't want to keep doing this? It's like every craziest guy you can meet in town walked there. It's, it's, it, was, it was hard work. You, know, you didn't have to use your brain much. It was hard work. So this guy's like fresh out of jail, and it was a rough, rough place. Wow. Good money, though. I think I made more on that money on that job than any job I've ever had. I can only imagine, you know, it sounds like the, like the, the physical uh, exertion in a job like that must have just been off the charts. It was, because it was a 12 hour day as well, five days a week, six, if you could do it. Um, but it was all contract based. So after five months, you would do six days, seven days, because then the contract would end. You know, you're up for a month, two months, and then come back again. Wow. Really good How money, long hours. 
Absolutely. Now, did, was that one of the reasons that you were like, nah, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to keep doing this. It's just too many hours. I think, yeah, basically, yeah. It was, uh, there was no social life or anything like that. You were just constantly at the docks for six in the morning for me till six at night. Wow. Yeah, that's, that sounds pretty intense. I, I remember, I mean, this is, this job is going to sound silly in comparison because it was just not, you know, anything nearly as physical, but I worked in a dairy farm for a while and like five months. And it was I, the, the only real comparison, honestly, between what you're talking about and, and uh, me is that there was a physical component, but it was a lot less. I mean, it was, and there, we weren't underwater. We were potentially love, well, not potentially like invariably covered in cow excrement, you know, as a result of the, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was somewhat less fun, but, uh, but nothing underwater, nothing where you'd have to, well, I, I shouldn't say nothing where you'd have to hold your breath. Actually, there was a lot of breath holding <laughs> on that job, but for very different reasons. Uh, but uh, no, it's very interesting. Now, when when you finally left that, what like what was the next phase? You went on to uh, a different line of work. Uh, what did you get into then? I bumped down quite, quite a few. Most of them, all manual labor. But um, I worked for oil mail for a while in the sorting office. I was there five years or so. That was easier. That's just sorting mail. Sure. Um, I didn't really take to indoor work too well. So I always ended up back out doing mm -hmm. something. Yeah, it sounds like the kind of, uh, I I have to say this, I feel like after, you know, that that kind of uh, underwater work, everything else would probably feel easier by by comparison, no? Yeah, definitely. And uh, for the job I'm doing just now, it's hard, it's hard going, more, more probably because of my age now. I'm not 20 anymore. Sure. But, but yeah, that was probably one of the hardest jobs. That and the building sites, that was hard going. I enjoyed it though. It's good. Absolutely. Now on the building sites in particular, like what were like what were some of the things that you did? Because I, you know, whenever I go past a building site, I always see there are a number of different people working and it seems like they've got different jobs specifically. Like uh, how like how does that work exactly? That's something that I'm I'm uh, I'm not as familiar with. Usually when you go in, all the tradesmen is in the bricklayers, joiners, blah blah blah. They would have the laborers that would want to work with them. So mm -hmm. if you like to work uh, with a bricklayer, I got picked for that quite a lot. That's hard because you get to mix cement all day, run up and down with the arms full of bricks, get them all stacked up. Mm -hmm. uh, work with the joiners, cutting their wood, carrying their wood, helping all of them, plasterers, doing all the dry mixes for them with the cement. So in nice. case of them, ask for whoever they wanted. It was a bit of a free for all. All the laborers would just line up and change men would go, you, you, or you. And you get your jobs. Right on. Now, I'm curious because this is something that you've been doing for so long. Was was fitness also a part of like your day-to-day -day life while you for the you know, for most of this time? Like you'd get off work and then you'd and then you'd work out, or was this something that like a routine that you started later in life? No, I started in high school. That's when I first started going to the gym. Um like I say, I kept going through phases, two, three months. I was good at it, funnily enough. I was strong, I was good at it. But I'd get bored, stop for a while, go back again. When I was labouring, yeah, I'd go two, two, three times a week. Wow. It wasn't quite so much boxing or muscle ups by then, but the, the weight often I picked up, I kept sure. going for, for a while. Did you find that to be... Uh, now, again, I probably at an earlier age, it wasn't as, it wasn't as challenging, but I... I can say, for instance, you know, I help my brother, my, my younger brother has a lawn care and snow removal business. And uh, so one summer he needed help and he was having a hard time finding anybody to help him. And uh, I said, all right, you know what, I'll, I'll help you out. And I realized, you know, apart from just being outside all the time, there's a lot of like repetitive movement. And so I think uh, a lot of people aren't prepared for it. And I'm, you know, I could see how it would be very easy to end up with aches and pains and stuff like that. Yeah. Did did you have issues like that early on, or or do you feel like the weightlifting helped you out? I did. It definitely helped me. I never, I mean, my shoulders, my chest, are twice the size of that now. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely helped that way. Absolutely. Helped that well because you see some of these old guys who are well, what about sixty? They're right bicep would be absolutely huge the left one not so much because right constantly with the same arm <clears throat> so you got a lot of even at that young age i could see them imbalances mm -hmm. 
watching the way some of the guys move, so one shoulder's higher than the other and all that kind of thing. Now, do they complain about like pains and stuff like that from that, or was that just uh Yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them did. But they've been doing it for 40 years or something, so they didn't know any different. They just kept going. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I remember once actually talking to a um, massage therapist, and I asked, I was like, oh, you know, who was one of the toughest cases you ever had? And I, and she said, ah, there was a farmer who came in once, and he was, you know, probably close to 70. She said his his muscles were like just gristle, you know, because he never stretched or anything like that. He was just constantly working. And she said it was like really, really hard to actually, you know, get these soft tissues to move. It's just like they're just so used to being so used to being hard. Did you find that that like with some of these laborious jobs that, you know, doing that plus, uh, you know, going to the gym and that sort of a thing that it started to get harder at some point or or it was were things relatively evened out because your physical activity went beyond just the job site? Yeah, I think one one probably helped the other. But um, the aches and pains things, that, that never really bothered me. Not through my 20s anyway. 30s, maybe a little bit. Mm-hmm. But then it is it start to catch up. Yeah. But looking back on the gym, I was bad for not warming up properly, feeling down properly. I was just tossing mates about. Sure. Well, it's easy when you're younger, you know, like you just roll out of bed and you can do whatever you want, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, to that, uh, in that regard, what like what are some of the obstacles you started to encounter as, you know, time went on and life got more hectic and, and that sort of a thing? It kind of happens without even noticing it. You just suddenly realize one day, it's like, oh, well, wow. so or your leg starts going to something and it's just what happened. Right, right. Yeah, but looking at things in a different way. And when, uh, like, when in your in your training process did you discover kettlebells? That wasn't that long. Well, not that long before finding you. It was just before the whole COVID thing hit. Mm. I think it was Dragon Door talking about it. the Russian hard style way of doing things. Sure. Just got me, so I started reading it. Didn't mention Strong First, but it did mention Pavel. <laughs> So I just started looking things up online and just more of curiosity, I think. And then I better got a kettlebell and then just like trying to figure out what to do, how to do it. Nice. Now, are kettlebells popular in Scotland or are they still kind of underground? Not really. I mean, probably like America, they're in the gyms. People are throwing them about, but not really in the, the style that you teach. Or kettlebell sports, not really a big thing. CrossFit's getting bigger. But I don't think I've met anybody yet who does the same stuff I do, we do. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah, I'm, you know, I suppose it makes sense on the one hand that in America it would be more common just because this was kind of like the the rebirth place, let's say, of uh, of kettlebell training. And I, I definitely remember in the early days, this is like 2008, um, you know, I'd go to sports stores and I'd be like, hey, do you guys sell kettlebells? And I'm like, what's that? You know, now you can get them at Walmart, which is just like, completely mind-blowing you know like that the you know over the course of like 16 or i guess 14 years you know there's been such a such a huge shift but but yeah back then it was not easy to find and i think it's it's still very much the same in uh in a lot of places um yeah but always that little bit behind america five ten years <clears throat> so it is getting bigger excellent but, yes. well somebody i need to show them a picture it's this <laughs> this is what it is yeah, I, I often I often try to like paint a picture with my words. I'm like, it's like a cannonball, and it's got kind of yeah. like a like a tea kettle handle on it. And uh, you know, even if people have never seen it, they're like, okay, I can I can kind of visualize like what it would look like. You know. Yeah. Uh, now you mentioned um, finding kettlebells shortly before finding me, and I think it was maybe around 2020 or somewhere thereabouts that you yeah. you ended up getting sucked into the sphere that is the Hebrew hammer and I'm speaking in the third person now, but um, so tell me a little bit about that because actually I don't even know this story. I don't know how you found me or how you stumbled across my, uh, my wily ways. I'm curious. It was one of those random Facebook adverts mm-hmm. where they give out a free, I think it was a seven day course on, um, I don't know what it was at the time. I was just curious to see what it was. And then you sent it out to the inbox and it was mostly crawling and swinging. Crawling, that, that confused me. I didn't understand it. But why they got me crawling. It made absolutely no sense. Yeah. So I love it. 
But like everybody else, I started doing it much harder than I thought it'd be, um, especially when the knee's off the floor. Oh, yeah. But I feel that X and cutting in. Um, swings have got much better at it. And um, I think gate tricks came just after that. The days, that's when I got into your style of teaching. Gate tricks right. was a I, I do remember that because uh, I've got the Facebook group, the Hebrew Hammers Hidden Hideaway, and yeah. it was you and a bunch of other people were were writing about your Gatrix workouts, and I remember you got like really really into it. What like yeah. so? Given the fact that you're on your feet like all day, I think you you've told me you sometimes have like twenty thousand step days or twenty thousand paces or whatever. It was thirty. I'm up to thirty now. Oh wow! Was, I got so thirty four times a four times a week twenty five thirty. That's four incredible. And how did you find that the first of all, when you did the gate tricks, how did you find that that um, that it worked together with your walking? Did it make it any more challenging? Do you feel like it made your your work easier? What was your experience? No, it definitely made it easier. That's the reason why I definitely stuck around because when I first saw it, it's like that's all I do. I just walk all day. Do I really want to come home and do yeah. some much and stuff like that? But I just took the chance anyway. Tried it. And it was great because it opened my hips up a lot more than I do at work. At work I'm just marching ahead all day. But when I come home and start doing all the different lunch variations and stuff like that, it really started to open things up, stretch them. It nice. felt really good. Only seven minutes. So yeah, put on at the end of a workout or, or just straight away from work. And did your coworkers notice a difference in your, like you had more pep in your step or you were you know keeping up more? Yeah. Yeah, walking quicker and keep just keeping a steady pace. Mm -hmm. So, all of the guys will do great to break, I've done a break, and then boom, boom, start slowing down. Sure. Because I've said, I wouldn't say I'm the fastest, but I'm definitely just stay at the same rate right through the whole shift. Mm -hmm. No, it's super cool. And now, um, after the gate tricks, you said, you know, after that, you, because it helped you out, you were kind of like, you were hooked, you were, you know, you uh, had sort of been convinced. You were a convert, we might say. So um, what was the next program or challenge or whatever that you ended up doing? Like what, like uh, that part, I don't remember. Only two weeks, maybe, I think, into gate tricks. <clears throat> and that's when 300 came out. Mm, yes. And that's the one I really went nuts for. Still, still am. It's a, yeah. a phenomenal program. That Love that one. And it's the first one. I think I looked at it and I thought, no, that's no chance. I'm not getting through that. But I did. I got through it. I loved it. Did you find in particular, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm curious because in addition to the, sometimes the 30,000 steps you're taking every day, plus doing 300 reps of, of various calisthenics yeah. exercises per day, um, did, did you find that it was it was wearing you down at all? Was it giving you more energy, more more strength? Was it? Yeah, I think just because there is it's designed it's not easy doing it, but I definitely got more energy off it. Strength, definitely. Um, just that constant moving instead of sitting down and having a break for a minute, two minutes, and then starting again. That's the pace that I loved. Um, next again day, I felt great at work. The same thing, it's just because it's working on so many different muscles, opening things up. Um, I didn't get a lot of yeah, doms or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's kind of the key because a lot of times people, um, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with taking days off by any by any means, and there's certainly not wrong, any, not anything wrong with with narrowing your focus. But I think what a lot of people end up doing is they narrow their focus too much for too long, and then they end up with like, ah, yeah, this is always sore, this is always tight, and and what have you. And so, given that you have a job that's that's already very physically active, and there's a lot of repetitive activity. It's good to hear that there is, you know, something that you can do that will keep you getting stronger, giving you more energy and yeah. uh, doing that without sacrificing the joints. Because like after a certain age, I think that's a really serious consideration, you know? Yeah, that's something I've only really realized properly. Probably the same time frame, the last two years, maybe, I started to kick in, especially with the shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Now, tell me about that, because I'm, I think it was like last year you were doing a push-up challenge. And you had you ended up with some shoulder issues because, uh, well, I'll I'll let you tell it because I think uh, you would definitely do a better service than I would. There's a, a push up uh, charity challenge. It was a post 
they were asked to pay 2000 for the month of November. So 100 a day. Mm. Um, but I got to 100 a day quite quick. So I ended up being 200, 300. By the end of it, I got to about three, three and a half thousand, I think, through the whole of November. And it, it actually felt okay at the end of that. It was more December, work things started catching up, and then they just went um, badly. Especially the right shoulder, that, that just completely went. So January, it was really bad. But December, that's one of the busiest, heaviest periods of work, so that never helps, obviously. No. And now, so that, yeah, that's the thing, is that if you got a physical job, it's not like, you know, they're not going to be like, ah, oh, we'll just put you behind a desk or, you know, you only have to do this. It's, you know, you still got to do the same thing. So like yeah. when, let's say when the, the, when work started to calm down and you, and things weren't as, as, you know, physically challenging, what were some of the things that you did to kind of restore the shoulders and, and get their function back? So I'm really focusing on more on the mobility side of things. Resistance bands became a, a big thing and um, still, still are. I like pull, pull on, push in, and rotating them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of body weight stuff doing the same thing as well. Yeah, that's a big thing. People don't think about that, but you know, your shoulders are like the most complex joint on your body. They have the, the most amount of mobility. And if you're only yeah. doing like one thing over and over again, that just has a tendency to, to wear away at them, you know? Mm. I found out with the bands, with the more I rotated them, it wasn't a quick fix. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't even weeks or a couple of months. It took a while. But, yeah. But I could feel the difference month by month. And the way they are now is massive compared to the start of the year in January. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like doing things again, like push-ups <clears throat> or pull-ups. Or... Now, when, when were you able to get back into things again? Because, again, you – well – I'd be curious what your what your training was like around the shoulder issues, and then when you were able to get back into some upper body stuff apart from just you know like we'll say, um, you know maybe some in between stuff for the shoulders. Like what was your what did your training look like? It was all pretty much focused on nothing more really than mobility, just really trying to get into. Not that it was just the shoulders, the shoulders, the hips, everything. So I kind of realized that. If that's happening to my shoulders, it's going to be happening everywhere. So we'll get into that age where if you've been training, working, manually working for all those years, it takes its toll. Absolutely. So, but, um, <clears throat> it's all like leg work. We do squats, we're fine. Lunges, we're fine. All that kind of thing. But last year, I got quite good at dips and pull-ups, but I just couldn't do them. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to push-ups, but just doing... Low reps, lot, lots of sets, but low reps. Gradually building things back up again. Nice, nice. Now, what, what was that? The same with the pull ups. It was just doing a few reps here and there. Just if any pain kicked in or anything, it just stopped. Yeah, it goes a long way. People don't think about that, but uh, you know, like when you practice something pretty frequently and you do it in a way that's not uh, putting a lot of stress on your body, your body can yeah. adapt pretty easily. And then next thing you know, it's you know. Not so tough banging out a bunch of pull-ups. Yeah, yeah, but def definitely it gets easier as you go along. But the bizarre things I've got that many of your programs and challenges and stuff like that. It's easy to go into stuff that's not targeting things like that. Mm -hmm. But you're still you one such challenge that I remember that you were doing this year. You were very enthusiastic about, it, and you got some really amazing results with was uh, golden calves in mm. particular. Now I think a lot of people would think. Because I mean, I don't know again what it's like in in Scotland, but there's there's kind of a stereotype about, let's say, like mail carriers, for instance, that they've always got big calves because they're always walking around all day, you know. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a chicken or the egg thing, you know. Like, is it that people with big calves and good at, good at walking around end up becoming mail carriers, or is it that carrying the mail ends up, you know, building up their up their calves? But given that you're walking, you know, thirty thousand steps a day, um. Most people would think, oh, man, if you were to do calf work on top of that, that's just got to be killer. But what, what was your experience with that? I was the same. When you first released the email, I don't think I bought it until the last day, second last day, for the same reason. I'm like, I'm on my legs all day. Edinburgh, where I live, it's a 
very hill, I say. I'm constantly going uphill, downhill. That's carrying these weights in the bins, so I don't know. But then I tried it and uh, packed on a fair bit of muscle quite quickly, even though it's body weight. Yeah. And, and I noticed going up and down the hills, I think that little bit of extra muscle just helped push me on that a little bit better. It took things away from the hips, the knees, the ankles, just having that bit of power. Definitely. Yeah, that is... Uh, a. One thing that many people don't realize is that even if you walk a lot, you might not necessarily be walking correctly a lot. And, you know, like you'll know if it's really, really wrong. But, um, you know, if you're not using enough of your, you know, your feet, your ankles, your lower leg in general, it's a sort of a thing. Help, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I am always curious because you've got people around you who see you perform. You know, it's one thing if we look at ourselves and like, oh, maybe I can see a little bit of a difference here or there. But it's always the other people in your life, you know, whether it is, you know, we'll say your spouse or your coworkers, or whatever. Did any of them take notice at the at the calves in particular? It was the mother after Jeff, and she saw the size of them. She took the photos uh, for me. I was going to say because those were some pretty professional looking photos that you posted in the group. Really once usually I just put set the phone up somewhere, but no, she took it once. So, so yeah, she was impressed with them at nice. work. Yeah, definitely. It's just the fact that I could, like I said earlier on, my pace kept going. Still does. Just keeps going all the time. And some of some of your coworkers, do they see like the the changes in your abilities as you're, you know, as you get up in years, and they, and they're like, how are you aging backward because you're stronger now? You're doing all this other stuff. Like, what do they say? I'm, that I have to know. Well, you start to feel your age when you start looking at twenty year olds, thirty of oh, twenty year olds. Because then um, there's a lot of them who just can't keep up. Mm-hmm. They're absolutely fun. They're in their twenties. I'm nearly fifty. Will be fifty this year, next year, and they're just not keeping up. And then that that's part of the reason is the training that I do. I just keep powering on till the shift's over. Yeah. Well, that's got to make you feel good knowing that you're you know you're out working these whippersnappers. I mean, honestly, some of them just get broke. It's like, I, I can't do this. Yeah. The, Keep going. Do you have you ever tried to give him any advice? Like, well, why don't you try doing this? You know, maybe this is what I found worked. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because a lot of them, they go to the gym, but what they do, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but you try giving them a wee bit of advice, but they're twenty year olds. They've got their own head. Well, you know, the other thing I find is that if if people view you in a different light, meaning like, oh, I this is my coworker, this is not like a fitness expert or whatever, then even if you have like great advice and you've got proof, and you know the proof is in the pudding, um, a lot of times they're just not going to listen because they're like, okay, well, that's not really his role or whatever. That's that's just not how I see him. Like we see that with family members. I, you know, for me in particular, for many years, it was like, you know, I would try to give my parents fitness advice, and you know, they're they're like, mm-hmm. okay, thanks. And then they would just do something different. Um, and uh, I think it's because our family members see us as, you know, a brother or son or cousin. They don't see you as, you know, and then likewise with your employers or your employees, rather. They don't see you as uh, employees, employers, coworkers, no matter what. They see you pr- uh, principally in that job and not, yeah, yeah not as a, the giver of fitness advice. But has anybody yeah. taken you up on that advice? No, no, that way, because like I said, the way I train the equipment I use, it's not that popular. So mm-hmm. people are, what do you do with it? What is it? Yeah. They don't they don't really get it. Yeah. But a, a steel mace, and that's another one. More. A, a, a what? <laughs> As in a what? Like, yeah. Okay. They're like, well, have fun. You know, in probably five <laughs> years, they'll all be using it. But for right now, they've got a. <laughs> They gotta let you be the guinea pig, right? Like, let's just see what happens to to old Jim. Yeah, and I like the the way the half style training should be a bigger thing, but in the gyms, people are just doing the usual on a thousand calorie type thing. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not my way of doing things. Certainly, yeah. I think people, in many cases, they they need on the one hand they need permission. They, I think they feel they need permission to do something weird. And they have to see other people doing it too, but because people don't like to stand out, you know? Yeah. Especially in stuff they just, they just don't get, don't understand. Yeah. Well, I, I know, for instance, when I was, uh, when I was living abroad, 
um, I used to go into like parks and stuff like that and I would crawl and I kind of got used to like, okay, some people are going to stare and you know, what have you. And, yeah. um, but I would also get people, I was, it was actually mostly older people. They were very curious. They were like, that's really cool what you're doing. Like this, they would call it like animal movements. You know, they didn't really know exactly what to even call it. Um, but, uh, I never convinced any of them to, to try it, or at least not with me. Maybe they went home and they tried it, but, um, uh, but the younger crowd in particular was like, yeah, no, thanks. You know, I'm, uh, I'd rather go to the gym and like, you know, get a pump or whatever. And so all you can do is you gotta, you gotta, uh, give the, uh, give the good example, but you can't expect them to follow it right away. I know, just saw, saw the seat. Absolutely. Um, now one of the things before we begin to wrap up that I, uh, that I thought was especially cool recently was you did Backtober, my Backtober challenge and uh you got some really great results from that one and for those of you who are listening and aren't familiar with it, with what it is um it was just during the month of october i had a challenge that was a, a daily focus on training your back but in different ways each time so that way you'd get everything top to bottom and uh again something that is designed to be done in conjunction with uh with the regular training and so you went through that and uh you had some really really cool results but that's it uh, that's the other one that really enjoyed it all all the way through then uh, I can't remember what happened. It was a Saturday morning. Oh, I was eating the t- I was on the tablet. That was it. I sat with my daughter, Phoebe, she's only three. So sat with her. I think it was two hours or something. Shoulders got a bit cranky. So done some uh, YTWLs, Y pulses, and just tried to open the shoulders up a bit. Mm-hmm. And bought your stuff, which you did. And then I don't even know why I thought, do some push-ups, just one set, just see how far I can push it, and got to 50. I've never got anywhere near that. Well, close to that, maybe 41, 42. Mm-hmm. 50 and then and that's been, without practicing push-ups, right? I haven't been doing push-ups uh, not, not for that whole week. I don't think I haven't done any. And it wow. wasn't like, like I want to do 50. It wasn't. It was just, I was just, just going to try it, and I done it. Done it at 50, and I think I could have got more, but, but no, I'm not pushing it. I got to the 50, that would, that would do. That's incredible. Yeah, I think uh, 50 push ups is kind of like the gold standard that a lot of people want to try to work toward. And that, and one of the things that obviously, you, if you want to get good at push ups, you have to do push ups, but a lot of people don't think about working on some of the muscles that are uh, on the opposite side of the body, specifically the back and the kind of role that they play. And so I think it's really cool that you went from you know, going crazy with push-ups a year prior, kind of, yeah. you know, then leaving them behind to let your shoulders sort of relax and catch up, not doing them for months and months at a time. And again, this is what most people would say, okay, I'm just so far behind because I haven't done anything in so long. But then yeah. you when you do the Backtober challenge and, you know, next thing you know, you've added enough strength and uh, overall power just to be able to knock out. Yeah, that little boost to the to the lats, I think, just really helps with the with vision. Big time, big time. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's certainly an achievement. I mean, fifty push-ups uh, training for it is impressive, but fifty push-ups without training for it is, yeah, you know, almost unheard of. Yeah, I know. I was I was shocked that it actually happened, especially just because didn't plan it, didn't train for it. It was just a random off the cuff. I'm going to try doing an asset. I didn't even have fifty in my head. It was just Let's see how far I go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the cool thing. You know, getting something for nothing. Well, I guess not nothing. You know, you still had to do other work, but you're getting like a like a bonus that you never even expected, you know, just yeah. knocking out these push-ups. And I, I would bet too that a lot of the, the gym rats that you like to or the gym rats that you work with would mm-hmm. be hard pressed to do 50 push-ups. Because again, that really oh, is a feat. Absolutely. Yeah, they're not the bits. No, yeah. I think that's any of them the bits. Now, I think maybe my favorite part of that story, and you haven't mentioned this part yet. I don't remember how far after it was, but I think you mentioned you were playing with your daughter afterward. And you were you still had enough energy to like throw her and play yeah, with yeah, her. Yeah. I just finished what I was doing. She was sitting watching her cartoons and she was running around my feet. So I just grabbed her right after it and started throwing her up and down in the air. And she was loving it. She was laughing her head off. So after, and she's just three now. I don't know. It's going to be at least 16 kilo, I would say. And so she's just straight up and catching them. That's yeah, amazing. Cool. And uh, I, she, yeah, probably had the time of her life, you know. 
Yeah, yeah, she loves that. She loves that kind of stuff. So absolutely. That I think really is, you know, we were talking a little bit before the the episode began. I think that really is kind of the essence of fitness that a lot of people, if you really, if you really push them, then they'll they'll kind of clarify what their goals are. And the biggest goal is they want to be able to make these memories with their kids, with their grandkids, you know, like everybody wants to look good, obviously, but I don't know of too many people who would say, yeah, I want to look great, but I don't care about how I move or how I perform, you know, like there's, and there's no reason you shouldn't be able to have the best, the best of both worlds to look great. Like, you know, you talked about, you know, putting on muscle just with body weight, calf raises, you know, um, but also be able to perform well. And again, not just in the exercise realm, but even outside of it. And, you know, I think most people after doing 50 pushups just would not have the, the strength or stamina left to be able to throw their 16 kilo or, or, you know, 35 pound daughter up in the air and catch her and, and all that other stuff. So you got the best of all worlds, my man. You're you're strong. You're... I've never had like Phoebe as my uh, my own kids, but I was forty five when she was born, so it was a big yeah. thing. I want to be able to, have, to keep doing things like that. Absolutely, absolutely. You, I remember, you know, Jeff Newport, who's been a guest on the show, has talked about one of his motivations early on was that he didn't want to be the dad sitting on the sidelines, you know, and the kids have and his kids would have to deal with that. He wanted to be he wanted to be able to play with them and keep up with them for, for many, many years. And I think yeah. that if, if that's your goal, kettlebells, calisthenics, and proper movement is one of the best ways to do that and look good, get super strong, and show the whippersnapper 20 and 30-somethings, you know, that, uh, yeah, yeah it's gonna, they're going to have to wake up pretty early if they want to try to, you know, beat you in any sort of physical exertion. Yep, then it's getting better. Absolutely. Now, um you post a lot in the Hebrew Hammers Hidden Hideaway. Is that the best place to follow you and your training or any place else that you like to post your workouts? I know that, that's the best. But I do have my own Facebook place, uh, page, obviously, but I'm not really on it much. I want to set up something, YouTube, Instagram, something like that. I'm not yeah. on it yet, but we'll get into that. Like, but right now, yeah. That's Excellent. Best. Well, I highly encourage all the listeners to uh, join the Hebrew Hammers Hidden Hideaway. If for no other reason than just to watch Jim's you know, all continuous and meteoric rise. Cause like I said, over the last two years, I've seen you just, you know, knock out one program, one challenge right after the other. And next thing you know, it's like you get these new superhuman powers, which is why I think that the, the Scottish mad lad is, uh, is the best possible nickname for you because, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, I also, I would have to say that, um, any other folks listening, you should feel encouraged to call him that I'm, he seems to enjoy I, you seem to enjoy the nickname as far as i'm aware if i do set up my own page or something that'll be the tag absolutely absolutely you should totally should you know I, that would be amazing um okay final question this is just a totally random one we talked about this once before because you and i did a, a consultation once and mm -hmm. as i mentioned before americans and i think really anybody who's a native english speaker loves the scottish accent and we were talking in particular about the differences in in Scottish accents because yours versus let's say uh, you might hear from you, you said you're from Edinburgh, right? Yeah, East Coast. Right. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sean Connery was born in Edinburgh. Is that right? Was, yeah. He's but, from here, yeah. But he had a very different accent. His was like um, I, I I think I read this once. It was like a, a type of accent that you only hear in a certain part of Edinburgh. Is that does that sound right? Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah, for my accent, it doesn't sound like me. Yeah. So yeah, he's from a different part, more central Edinburgh. Gotcha. And so his accent was more common in in that part of Edinburgh versus like other parts. Yeah. Now, is is it like that in other parts of Europe? I mean, we'll we'll take like let's say Scotland, Ireland, England, Wales. I you know a lot of Amer to the American ear, for many people, they can tell the difference between some of those but uh i know that even within those areas like even within let's say you know london england there are different accents is it like that also in other major cities in scotland yeah you, you can go four or five miles in any direction and it instantly changes it's there's hundreds of accents all over all over really? the uk but scotland as well you only have to go west five miles ten miles starts to change go north starts to change that's amazing. Mixture. Where it all comes from, I don't know. But yeah. Now, do you do you ever find that 
you, well, I'm guessing if you can detect the accents from just, you know, those few miles away, if you run into somebody, you can tell, okay, he's from Scotland or she's from Scotland, but she's probably from this city and maybe even this section of town. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I don't know that we have anything quite, the closest thing I would say in the U S that we have, because I have my accent is, uh, alternatively referred to as like a midwestern accent but i think to be even more precise it's a great plains accent which is like a very apt name because it's a very plain sounding accent there's really not a lot you know um but uh has more to do with you know the the great plains of, of the u.s but um uh. but it's a very neutral sounding accent overall but if you go start going south you can start hearing some different accents and i know that in the south there are different accents depending on where people are, but but I always felt like unless you go like really far into Georgia or Texas or whatever, um, they they tend to be pretty subtle. So, um, hey, but you have to go hundreds of miles before you hear like a totally different one. You know, Changes. yeah. So it, that's a it's a very it's a very curious thing I think for American ears or you know uh, other folks who who might speak uh, or maybe we'll say maybe Canadians have the same thing, yep. but. Um, but that's very cool. I'm uh, I'm a big fan of all things Scotland. I don't know if you remember that back in the olden days there was an SNL, the the Scottish store. Remember that with Mike? I think it was Mike Myers. Yeah, yeah he, but he, not... he, on his accent. Is, I think is, is it, region or something? I think is his pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm sure now, he said that was Glass Region from Glasgow. Yeah. I think. Now, if you let's say he was behind you and you couldn't see him. And he asked you a question like, hey, I'm looking for this, that. Would you think he was from Glasgow or would you think this is a guy who's trying to sound like he's from Glasgow? Well, I was quite convinced. I don't think he probably would think he was from Glasgow. He was right. good. That's very impressive. It's very impressive. And yeah, uh, yeah. well, I uh, my hat's off to Mike Myers then. I mean, Americans, I think we hear somebody, one of well, I guess he's Canadian, but we'll say North American. Yeah. We hear somebody trying to do an accent from like England or Australia or wherever, and we're like, you know, that's good enough for us. Sounds pretty, pretty legit. So it's good to hear that. American, that? He, Robin Williams, he was American and he was pretty good on what was that, Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, was his Scottish accent pretty good? Yeah, it was good. I think that was Edinburgh, based on Edinburgh, I think. Interesting. What part? Central, like, well, I guess it wasn't, didn't sound like Sean Connery. So what part of Edinburgh, maybe? No, no, that was, that was probably, I don't know what part he was on. But Sean Condor, he probably got elocution lessons and stuff for his, uh, for his acting. Well, you could have surprised me because uh, it, it, he even played, he played an Arab king and like the man who would be king. And he's like, my name is, you know, whatever. And he just had the very, the same, it was the same thing. I don't know where that shh came from. That's, that's, I think that's unique to him. Yeah. That's the thing I always wondered about because, you know, you hear uh, other folks speaking Scott, uh, with a Scottish accent. And mm -hmm. uh, it sounds very different. And then you hear Connery, who obviously, you know, was born and raised in, in Scotland. And uh, yeah. yeah, he had the sure for everything. Yeah, um, it's, uh, Joe Billy Connery, obviously, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a shite for short eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's very good. Well, there are some other funny ones, but uh, because they, they sort of reference some naughty words, we'll have to say them off air. Uh, but some funny Connery impressions. Uh, uh, but uh, well, at any rate, we could go on and on about, you know, accents and Scotland all the live long day. But uh, I know that you probably want to get back to, you know, I think uh, we, this is a decent time. I'm not interrupting your training. Is that correct? I, yeah, that's right. Man. It's OK. Just... Oh. Yes. I was going to say if I if I had, I would be like, OK, well, then I definitely have to let you go immediately because I don't want to. Don't want to get in the way of that. But uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a great chat. And to all the listeners, I, once again, I highly recommend that you check out the Hebrew Hammer's Hidden Hideaway. Check out Jim Bain's most excellent posts. He is a regular poster there. And as always, have fun and happy training.